Hello, good evening everybody. My name's Dan Moss and uh, I'd just like to welcome everyone to what is webinar 14 in this series um, delivered between Emerging Minds and the Mental Health Professionals Network. And tonight's webinar is on engaging children and parents affected uh, by child sexual abuse. Very challenging issue for many practitioners uh, along many sectors. So really looking forward to being able to bring this webinar to you tonight. Uh, also welcome to the, the 1,024 of you out there who are so far uh, joining us. Really great to, to see so many of you interested in this topic. And also just welcome to those of you who will be watching this po podcast. So Emerging Minds and MHPN wishes to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land across Australia upon which our webinar presenters and participants are located. We wish to pay respect to the elders past present and future, to the memories, the traditions, the culture and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. So this is the last of our webinars for Series 2. We've really loved um, being able to bring these to you this year. Um, but starting uh, in the next financial year, MHPN and Emerging Minds will be bringing you a, a fresh series of webinars on child and infant mental health. So we'd really love you to uh, join us for those and please um, to receive invitations to these events, please um, please log on www.emergingminds.com.au forward slash subscribe. So just a little uh, word on how to uh, use the fairly new platform that we're using for tonight's uh, webinar. So the purple button uh, allows you to access the chat box. Um, the blue button uh, will allow you to submit a question. Uh, the light blue button will allow you to um, uh, see the slides and the resources available. And there are a number of really good resources uh, that we'll speak to you about later tonight, uh, thinking about practicing with children and families around child and sexual abuse. Uh, the refresh button is the green button with the circle arrow. And there is a help button if you need assistance and you can message Redback directly or ring 1800 733 416 if you're having technical problems and can't view tonight's webinar for whatever reason. So the learning outcomes tonight, really importantly, uh, at the webinar's completion, we'd really like you to be able to outline the prevalence of child sexual abuse in Australia and those children who are most at risk to describe practical strategies to support children affected by sexual abuse, to disclose and respond from mental health professionals that can support recovery, to identify effective engagement strategies with parents and family members, which focus on consistent and supportive messages, which helps the child affected by sexual abuse to make sense of their experience and recover from the negative effects. And we'd like you to be able to outline ethical practices in reporting sexual abuse and how to refer, refer to specialist agencies. So I'm really uh, excited to be able to uh, introduce tonight's panel. Um, and so without any further ado, um, I'd first like to welcome Dr May Sue, a general practitioner from New South Wales. And May, as a general practitioner, what for you has been important in your practice when responding first to children who have recently disclosed sexual abuse. Um, thanks, Dan, and thanks for welcoming me. Look, I, I think for myself, it's about being mindful of my own emotions and self-care while caring for others and balancing this with practice organisation and running. So I, I know it can always trigger a lot of emotions and it can be pretty overwhelming to see someone and be concerned about them, but we have to also make sure that we're looking after ourselves because we can't look after others if we're not being mindful of that. Thank you, May. Uh, our next uh, facilitator tonight is uh, Mr. David Tully. David's the Practice Manager for Specialised Family Violence Services for Relationships Australia, South Australia, and has many years experience both practicing and supervising practices in child sexual abuse. David, um, in the context of your work and your long experience of work in child sexual abuse, 
and your families at Relationships Australia. What are the key messages that you provide parents about the issue of child sexual abuse? Uh, for us, I think the most critical thing around responding to child sexual abuse is being really clear about um, responsibilities and often both parents and the child who's been subjected to sexual abuse are recruited in to blame themselves, um, a sense of shame and failure. And really what were our key messages, and particularly as us as organisations, as mental health professionals, um, the quality of social response can be a really important mediating factor of the both the immediate impacts of abuse and the long-term sort of social and mental health outcomes. So those social messages about children and families not being responsible, that the perpetrators are only responsible for abuse. Thank you, David. And uh, lastly, we have Dr. Liz Coventry, who's a psychiatrist based in South Australia. So Liz, as a psychiatrist, how do you work with children who blame themselves for their experiences of sexual abuse? particularly when the perpetrator has made them believe they were complicit in the abuse? Uh, I think th this is a, a good question and it, it kind of sums up which, which is what is often at the heart of working uh, with children and families who have um, been victims in this way. Um, I think it sort of that ties in well with what David was just saying. It's ultimate, the ultimate goal is to try and find a way to um, assign blame and shame and responsibility in the right area, um, but it can be very tricky to kind of navigate that. So you would start, you know, uh, at the end of it by sort of talking about, um, you know, ed the education around that, that this is very common, but then you would be sort of in a very nuanced way working over time to help that child shift that very gently without further dumping them into shame. Thanks so much, Liz, and really looking forward to hearing your presentation later tonight. Um, so what we're going to do now is hear our um, three presenters talk. And... Um, you would have received the case study, which uh, much of what we're going to discuss tonight is um, centred around. And it's focused on Sally, who's an 11-year-old girl. Sally lives at home with her mother, Janet, and her younger sister, Evie. About 12 months ago, Janet was introduced... Uh, Janet started seeing Gary. And Gary, um, from the early time, took a particular interest in Sally. Now, this led to um, some unfortunate experiences for Sally in which sexual abuse uh, ensued until finally uh, she woke up the courage to tell her mum about what was happening to her. As part of this, the police have now been notified and the first thing that, that Sally and her mum have decided to do is to go and visit their local GP. And so within this, with this in mind, we're going to now hand over to May who's going to discuss uh, what a GP might um, be thinking about and uh, in this circumstance. May, welcome. Thanks, Dan. Um, look, one of the things that really strikes me about this case is um, who is the patient when we're seeing them? So is it Janet, is it Sally, Evie or Gary? And who's initiating the care? Um, so as a general practitioner, we may actually be involved with multiple members of the family, um, if not ourselves and one of our colleagues maybe. So let's just hold that thought for a moment because if we just assume that Sally is the main focus of care at the moment, then the other thing is to consider is how do we conduct the interview and engage with Sally? So there might be some organisational aspects of how we do this, like who's going to be in the room as you talk to her? Is it going to be um, Sally by herself or is it going to be with her mum present? There's reasons why you might do both and you might want to do a combination of both. This might require some scheduling and planning to be able to coordinate it, particularly if it's going to occur in an unscheduled manner, which is what often happens in general practice in a busy day. In engaging Sally, you might want to consider that Sally might not actually want to be there. She might be experiencing blame, shame, early parentalisation um, and a sense of over-responsibility. The background that we have in this case suggests that there's a story for being alone, bullied. Um, she sounds like she might have some learning difficulties or concentration difficulties. 
Um, Gary might have actually felt a need, um, but she feels terrible for having taken away. So she's been felt she has to um, keep secrets. And she might also not quite have the language to be able to talk about what happened, um, why she feels the way that she did. I think what's also really helpful to reflect upon, uh, what are the driving forces which keep Sally in the room? Um, why did she choose to tell her mum? Um, and that's really important because it also might be the reason that keeps her in the room when you're seeing her and engaging with her. So the motivating force might be a sense of wanting to protect Evie, but she might also feel confusion and shame from the backlash, backlash of Evie's blame towards her. I am concerned about Evie, who's the nine-year-old, if you remember in the case, and she might have already picked up that something has happened, um, and addressing this should be developmentally appropriate. So when we start to consider um, how to engage Sally and her family, um, it makes us think well, what made Sally and Evie vulnerable and what made Janet vulnerable. Unfortunately, we know that childhood sexual abuse is common. There's a scarcity of information um, in, in terms of rigorous data on the prevalence of childhood sexual abuse in Australia. So the prevalence estimates vary quite a lot, um, depending on what classification of abuse um, is. But some studies in Australia estimate the rates of sexual abuse in boys up to 12% and up to 27% for girls, so that's 27%. Um, if we look at international studies where there's um, clearer data patterns, then we show about one in five women and one in 13 men report having been sexually abused as a child. That's from the WHO. So if we think about what increases increase is, um, probably one of the biggest factors is gender. Um, boys can be affected as well, but it's probably, um, it appears that um, girls are more vulnerable. Um, social isolation and lack of support for someone to talk to, to confide in. So a parent who's more vulnerable, um, which sounds like that's what's happening in this circumstance, might mean that it's more likely that the child might be more vulnerable. And this likely reflects the impact on the opportunity to confide and on the social engagement. Vulnerability doesn't mean that it's due to the victims or the parental fault. It's also important to remember that a lot of the time the victim's mothers or fathers might be victims of intimate parent abuse, but at times they might also be the perpetrator. And where we think that both the mother and child are being abused, we need to make sure that we're supporting and believing, not blaming um, them, including validation that it's not their fault and that their safety is ensured. So blaming the child or the parent is not helpful for the recovery process. It can be a really incredibly upsetting and devastating situation for both the child and the family members. All abuse is really difficult for children to disclose, and in particular sexual abuse. So in relation to sexual abuse, the perpetrator is likely to have groomed or threatened the child, which makes it really difficult for them to reveal the abuse. And it may be really helpful to be personalised in talking to Sally about this, so using third person, giving examples that provide a context to experience and work towards recovery for her and her family. Sally might believe she um, feels that she's not being believed. She might assume that abuse is a normal life event. She's been told that this is my little secret, so it confers a threat in informing. She might want to protect Gary, um, particularly because she might enjoy certain aspects of the relationship. And she might be experiencing disbelief or confusion and uh, maybe a sense of unreality. So children might dismiss early incidents as a dream or a nightmare or just their imagination. She might also feel like she's responsible for what happened or she might feel guilty that she didn't inform somebody earlier about what's happened. Um, we, we talked about lack of opportunity. So that can be a common factor for why it doesn't get disclosed. There might be a perceived lack of opportunity to bring it up or there might be a lack of linguistic ability to express what's actually happening or the cognitive ability to understand what's happening. Um, boys may find it more difficult to um, disclose or there might be cultural beliefs which make it less likely. So how do we support Sally and her family? It's important to consider what's protective for Sally and her family, what helped her and her family reach out and how do we build on this in recovery? I think of factors that enhance resilience and recovery in terms of physical safety uh, and security, psychological safety and connection. 
So if we consider this structurally and organisationally, it could look a bit like this. Where the family, school provide connection and ideally structures and routines that support psychological and physical safety. It might require legal processes to achieve this. Um, the healthcare teams, family and carer support enhance the capacity of these groups to do this in an effective recovery focused um, approach. And as a GP, we wear lots of different hats in our care for Sally. So it might be immediate concerns like ensuring safety and ensuring Gary no longer has access to files in the circumstance that Gary is also a patient of the practice. Um, we might also advocate that, Gary, that Janet involve legal services, particularly if there are custody issues, um, where the child's at risk mandatory reporting is required as a matter of law. And regarding Sally's physical and psychological care, I'd also be assessing um, does she require an urgent physical assessment with the sexual assault services? Past the immediate safety, then we'll need to be looking into further support um, in terms of like um, assessment for psychological needs um, with a child psychiatrist or psychologist. And there are different funding models for psychotherapy which can be helpful for this. Um, so I think a lot of us know about better access, but they may also um, uh, have their own private health insurance or private funding. And a lot of people aren't aware that there's something called victim services, uh, which is particularly helpful in these sort of circumstances. So if she's in school, she might also have access to a school counsellor. So other care needs for Sally are some of the educational needs and support. We need liaison with the school and the school counsellor um, to ensure that she's got those learning supports. Um, so we'd be assessing the family structures and supports which might benefit from referral to NGOs um, or family support. Um, and recognising the factors at play within the family health. And I know this will be spoken about later. As a GP, I'm just going to acknowledge referral processes can be really frustrating and confusing. So um, the child wellbeing unit can assist with these processes, but I, I've found it actually can be quite difficult sometimes as a general practitioner to like, um, initiate these without those supports. Um, look, I'm going to leave this here for resources, but um, you're actually going to have attached to the reference, um, this attached to the reference, attached to the resources, so I'm not going to dwell on this. Um, and I'm going to hand it back to Dan. Thank you so much, May. That was a really informative and, and fascinating view into how a GP might work uh, with someone like Sally and her family. David, um, you're next up to, to give us a, um, a, some sense of how um, you might, in your course of work, work with Sally and her family. Okay. Uh, thanks, May. I think that sets a really good context for this discussion. And, you know, uh, for me, it's about, for us as practitioners, having a chance to think about and reflect about what our own values, experiences, and the way we want to portray this within our family, uh, the families and children we work with. It's really important. So thanks. So for me, one of the really important uh, factors and the one that we can play all a critical role is understanding um, how we can provide a positive uh, and engaged sort of social response. But to do this, we need to think about um, the context which child sexual abuse occurs in. Now, unfortunately, May gave us some of the statistics around the level of sexual abuse in Australian community in the year 2020. And I think that's something as a community we all need to reflect on and maybe have a collective sense of shame that that's still happening at that level of rate. And also May talks about it, you know, often quite fragmented systems as well, and both in terms of preventive and providing treatment responses as well. But for me, one of the really important things is to understand the context that sexual abuse occurs in. So for me, um, this is a model I was provided, I think, about 20, 25 years ago, and it's been really important that we slow down and think about what we mean when we think about... Um, sexual abuse. So first of all is understand that the sexual abuse occurs, child sexual abuse occurs for children. That's a childhood state or time of being a child. So that means we need to be tuned into the developmental stage which children are at when abuse occurs, both at the physical, developmental, psychological, biological level, at a whole high range of levels. And abuse actually relates to that there's abuse of power that goes on. And ultimately I believe that we live in a community and the statistics around sexual abuse I think uh, strike me as somewhat evidence around that, a world that is organised in ways that privilege adult needs and experiences over those of children. Um, and also the second part of that is also, you know, not always, but uh, 
sexual abuse is a crime that's often perpetrated by adult men and sometimes adult young men against both boys and girls as well, but not always. There was an article in um, today's paper about a, a female teacher abusing a boy. But it's also important context about the messages around sexuality and violence that we all are working. And what, what, what this means then is the actual tactics that abusers can then use operate because of that social context. And our job is then to how do we um, provide conversations the support and information that sort of becomes really clear about who, who is responsible for abuse and understanding this context is really important. As I said, so all abuse occurs in context there's a difference in power and this power is misused. Um, and the, the ability for the child or the young person or and even their parents to be aware of these power differences greatly impacts the meaning. So it means when we understand a tactic like when we look within the scenario that Gary told her uh, Gary told Sally that her mum would be furious with her if she found out. This is because Sally doesn't have a range of um, information and understanding that Gary has done the wrong things, what Gary do has done against the law um, as well. It also impacts how others make sense of being abused, so the myth in society that children are sexually uh, seductive or can make adult decisions around um, sexual activity. And that's why we have laws in the country saying what about age of consent is because we acknowledge that children can't consent. But often that, um, that context is used by perpetrators through the use of tactics to entrap a child into believing they can somehow consent. So what this often leads to is debilitating feelings of self-hatred and shame. And that's uh, quite indicative of a child's ability to attribute responsibility and blame themselves for the sold as well. And we see this in the scenario, scenario where um, um, Sally is almost wor worrying whether Janet secretly blames her. She'd be worried about that um, um, that he's not allowed to see the family and all those sort of issues that crash in on her as well. And I argue that tax abuse are actually strategically um, put in place to obscure the developmental process, suggesting that children can make adult decisions. So for us to be really clear on this, uh, what I call politics of abuse in the way we respond and really be able to be reflective about the, the words we use, the language we use, um, about where we, who we see as being responsible for abuse. Where, where the mirror, I always refer to this idea of a mirror, where's the mirror, mirror being pointed? Is it being pointed about the perpetrator who's made decisions to hurt the child or is a mirror being pointed at Sally or her mum or other people? So where's that mirror pointing? Because for me, that's really critical in understanding how the effects appear in uh, children and young people and even adult, people, adults' life because of abuse. So the tactics perpetrators use rely on, um, first, the very developmental process that all children, and we all need to go through to develop into adults, and also the politics of abuse. The tactics then get used. And that's why, um, by Gary, by um, engaging with her, by giving her gifts, um, and then turning on her that somehow that this is her responsibility, it takes care of both, uh, takes in both the developmental process and the politics of abuse. And that leads to beliefs that um, both Sally and her mother are forming about themselves. And often this has a, a major bearing on the effects like flashbacks, anxiety, depression, risk-taking, self-harm, and all those sort of other concerns that uh, unfortunately know correlate extremely high with experience of sexual abuse as well. So for us to be able to respond, we nearly really need to be clear around appreciating the developmental journey and honouring that developmental journey. We also need to be very clear about the politics of abuse and understanding those belief systems that are formed in the context of abuse because of the, the power context that information and ideas are formed in. Like an example, I worked with a young boy many, many years ago, but about 10, 15 years ago, and he was told by his perpetrator, if he told what he did, he'd go to jail and they would kill him. And we all know that Australia hasn't had um, capital punishment for many years. But if you're eight or nine, you don't know that. So that's why those tactics work as well. And also the importance, and I think it's not just understanding the, the dreadful impacts of abuse, but also honouring the way that uh, both Sally and Jean have tried to respond to that issue. And one of the really things that really stood out to me in the case study was um, one of the things I think that led to Sally eventually um, disclosing was when she was worried about her younger sister maybe um, was being abused as well and struggled to find the words and the language and the concepts to even name and, and, and describe what sexual abuse is, but there was a real ethical sense of having to find some way to talk about it, you know, because of concern for her little sister. So this is, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but this is an exercise we often use with children and young people. 
where we, we talk about what makes a responsible adult or what might be what makes a trustworthy adult or, or what makes an irresponsible adult or what makes a tricky adult. You know, the words we often use from children and the concepts that make more sense for them. But describing what a trustworthy adult is, they're fair, they're honest, they're reliable, straightforward, uh, care about other feelings. And then we talk about what an irresponsible adult might be. And they, young people listen, they might be tricky, unfair, manipulative, inconsistent, self-centred. And then we ask that child, if you put any child, not you, any kid who's 11 in this context, you put an 11-year-old with responsible adults, what would happen to them? They'd, they'd be taken care of, they'd be looked after. What happens if they do the wrong thing? Well, they would you know, maybe be told how to do the right thing and supported to do the right thing. So if you put any 11-year-old child with an irresponsible or a tricky adult, what happens? Harm may come to them. And this is a really important moment for the child to be able to decouple the idea that, that the abuse wasn't about them it was about, unfortunately, their, um, the, the abuser taking, care, uh, taking advantage of their vulnerabilities, as all children are, um, um, in that developmental process as well. So often this leads to a lot of the effects that we see around abuse. It's my fault, has a strong link to guilt, guilt and self-pain. I must have asked for it, self-loathing, I'm damaged goods, I have no control, nightmares, anxiety, nothing will ever change, drug use and depression. So what we're trying to do is undermine those sort of belief systems that lead to some of these effects to really create some space to be able to process and talk about these issues. And now it's not that simple, obviously. Uh, you know, the, the shame is a really powerful feeling. Um, but, you know, this is a framework I think that if we can hold um, strongly to, we can definitely make a difference as well. And just, just some brief comments for parents as well. I think it's important that for parents that they can believe their children, that they can stay grounded, that they can seek help, um, they can keep the child young person reassured, um, you know, giving them information at a developmentally appropriate level. And that's one of the really dreadful effects of sexual abuse when we need to be able to, you know, our children and young people are trying to make sense of behaviours and we need to be able to developmentally appropriately explain what these sort of um, sexual behaviours are and why they're inappropriate as well. There can be a great sense of parental sense of failure, uh, you know, particularly for mothers feeling like they haven't protected their children or fathers as well just a sense of being overwhelmed, may echo their own experience. We, we talked about those prevalence data and we know for a lot of parents their own experiences can either inform their ethical response or make it tricky for them or a bit of both. Uh, and the fear that the child is forever damaged and will never recover as well and be able to provide information about what the support process and, the, and that change is possible if the child's support is not to feel a sense of self-blame. Thank you so much, David. Uh, really appreciated um, that really thoughtful presentation. Now going to move on to Liz. Liz, welcome. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to um, my co-presenters as well. Um, the first slide I have here is around the epidemiology, and I think May covered that really well, so I won't dwell on this slide at the moment. Whenever I'm um, faced with a... a a new uh, client or patient, I always kind of try and make space to think what makes me curious, what, where does, you know, where does my thinking go? And I guess that's how I've approached this uh, particular case study. And the things that really firstly stood out in my mind was Sally's age. So she's 11, she's at the um, beginning of neuronal pruning, uh, which is an important, um, you know, uh, vulnerable time for her brain. Um, she's on the cusp or possibly at the beginning of adolescence and puberty. Um, and this, you know, all has big effects on her, uh, her emotional and physical development. I was also very curious about the potential here for her to have a um, formal or diagnosable learning um, problem. Um, and I wondered if they sort of it lay in the expressive um, language uh, end of things and and then you know so what influence would they have on any therapeutic process that I might try and uh, employ with Sally and her family. Another issue that I thought was worth thinking about was what's her mother's reflective capacity? Is Janet able to kind of sit back and think of the um, you know how Sally is uh, experiencing this whole uh, uh, the, the, you know, the disclosure and then the talking to multiple people about the experience, um, but also, uh, 
you know, her feelings about the experience herself. And what, so what capacity does she then have to regulate her own emotional experience in supporting her daughter to work through some very difficult um, feelings and, um, you know, unpacking some beliefs that may be really hard to kind of, you know, hear coming from your own child. Um, and then I was very curious as well about, you know, what interni internal working models of relationship do each of the family members here, particularly the younger sister Sally and her mother, have? Uh, what, do they, what, what are they operating from here and how do they interact with each other? So then I started thinking about, well, what general principles would I work from in working with children who have disclosed sexual abuse and with their families. And I think everyone's sort of been consistent um, tonight that this is a, you know, a systems approach is vital, that we have to, you know, acknowledge that an individual exists within multiple systems that usually don't interact particularly well, particularly when they're at the, um, you know, a formal level. Um, the other key principle is that the best buffer against this kind of trauma for a child is to be held in a sensitive and attuned way in the mind of their caregiver, who is able to, um, you know, convey to the child that, that that we will be able to survive this process together. And another principle that I think drives the work that I do is that it has to be led by the child. Um, often we have as adults an agenda to get things kind of sorted, but that may not work. Um, in what the child is, in, in what the child brings to the, the room. Um, and we have to work within whatever limitations that she might bring to this process. Uh, I think it's a key aspect of working within the space of trauma in general and childhood sexual abuse in particular, that I have to provide a safe, empathic space for all members of the family who are engaged in the work, even if it's a fractious family dynamic. Um, I must be alive to the impact of shame, um, again, in all members of the family, and the meanings that they all bring to what this to what this event means, how this impacts them personally and as a family as well. And it might be necessary for individual members of the family to have their own therapy or therapist. That a you know family based approach may be important for some part of this but it may not be um, it may not be helpful for Sally to have everyone involved all of the time. I'm very aware that as the child psychologist uh, psychiatrist amongst the group I um, should uh, talk a little bit about what I might do about the depressive symptoms that Sally was displaying in the case study. Um, firstly uh, the first principle is you watch and you wait and you wait and you wait um, you see how well the family engages with the therapeutic work. Um, you try and bolster as many natural supports as possible um, and engage the parent or parents as much as possible. And only if function is faltering and developmental progress is compromised and after consulting with colleagues, would I consider any kind of pharmacological therapy, which would be for a time-limited time it would be time limited um, and, you know, up for review fairly frequently as well as she, you know, progresses into different stages of adolescence. So that's kind of the general approach that I would take to working with this family. Thank you, Luke. Dan. Thank you. Um, so they were, I'm sure you're agreeing, they were really fascinating and, and really comprehensive uh, presentations from our three panellists. So thank you to all of you. And uh, thank you also to the 1,500 of you who are currently uh, joined this webinar. It's great to have such an active um, audience. And thank you to those of you who have sent through some really amazing questions. And so what we're going to do now is spend about the next half an hour trying to answer some of these questions for you through our panellists. Um, and so, May, I might start with you. Um, Kendall has talked about um, uh, the challenges sometimes in making referrals to specialist services, not only for the child themselves, but sometimes for the family members uh, who might also need to, to speak to someone about the effects of the abuse on them. 
can you talk to us a little bit about how you make referrals as a GP uh, to increase the chances that the child and the family will actually attend? Yeah, thanks, Dan. It's a really good question. Um, being really non-judgmental um, in engaging, um, there's enough shame and guilt already occurring already. Um, and also, one of the things when you're being asked to make a referral is that there's often a feeling of pressure and an urgency of people wanting to get urgently in to see someone. But I think there's already a lot happening in this space and a lot and, and actually, sometimes when the person or the family's already feeling really overwhelmed and they're not really sure where to start, it can actually stop them from being able to engage and do anything. So I probably, once we have the person safe, probably start to look into trying to work out what's going on, reassurance, breaking it all down into manageable chunks, because then we can try to work out what's going to be the most appropriate care rather than risking rushing in, re-traumatising everyone or escalating the distress. And this is really important if the person's already feeling overwhelmed or there's a pattern of coping with avoidance. And we have to remember that when we're under stress, we will revert back to primitive coping mechanisms. And that's also true of children and teens, like even if they're particularly mature or, or responsible children, they're, they're all going to find it particularly hard when they're stressed. Um, and we have to remember teens often get lumped in with these expectations of being small adults when really developmentally there's a lot going on and they might not be emotionally or cognitively aware of why they're feeling the way that they are. So this goes back to what Liz was saying. So it, it really requires really careful and non-judgmental support to develop these skills and it might take a long time, you know, even years for them to get to the stage where they're able to deal with what's happened um, in the ways that I think some other people around them may want them to. Um, so particularly if the abuse had occurred from a younger age or for a prolonged duration, it is a different approach working with younger children um, compared to teenagers. And teenagers, particularly those who bring themselves in will particularly need to be engaged to return for care. So I think of it as creating a safe space for them, which sadly might be the only safe space that they have. Mm, thanks so much, May. Liz, the next question's for you, and it's from Chantel. Um, Chantel's asked um, for any kind of recommendations for working with children who have been sexually abused, uh, but also may be uh, particularly non-verbal or may have an intellectual disability. Can you describe your work uh, with these children? Um, I think the general principle that you have to work with children wherever that they're developmentally presenting is the key thing. Um, so uh, I, I think that, you know, if, if, some, if you've got a child who has an intellectual disability, you still have to be really careful to not make assumptions about what they can and can't understand, or um, it, but it may be that we have to adjust the way we work with them in terms of using more, um, uh, you know, non-verbal non approaches. So it might be the use of play or toys or, or things like that. Um, it, it, it's it's a it's a tr it, it's a tricky area, of, you know. In, childhood in general, but for someone with an intellectual disability, you're still interested in what meaning they've made out of this process. Uh, and they still have, you know, their basic attachment needs need to be met. So you're wanting to make sure that mum and dad or, you know, whoever their caregivers are, are on board and providing a, you know, wrapping around them and, create, you know, giving them a feeling of safety and also a space if they're able to kind of articulate in whatever way that looks like, you know, what they need to get back to a place of, of you know, equilibrium within within themselves. Um, so, you know, you may not be using the same, you, you, you may need to adjust the language that you use or the, what you do with them in the room, but I think, uh, and it may slow the process down, but uh, I, you know, I think it's really, you know, given that intellectually disabled children are at, greater risk than other children of sexual abuse. We do need to kind of have, um, you know, something in our repertoire to kind of be able to reach 
them where they're at, but it's very much dependent on what they bring into the room. Yeah, thank you, Liz. David, uh, a question um, from Nicole uh, is, uh, we've talked a lot about um, the immediate effects of child sexual abuse on, on Sully, but if um, Sully doesn't get the support that she needs, how can these um, effects of sexual abuse manifest themselves in adult life? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I think really importantly that the importance of early intervention is really critical and the importance of this conversation and having, you know, everybody taking time on a Monday night, 1,500 of us to talk about that is really, really critical because I think the long-term effects of child sexual abuse um, can be really devastating. Now, I don't want to um, catastrophise more than I need to, but, you know, different people find different pathways through dealing through sexual abuse. And I think the really critical thing in knowing, working with adults who experience sexual abuse who found a way to get some uh, stability and some space was really having a, a place where they either were supported that it wasn't their fault or finding information wasn't their fault. But we don't. We, 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 we know the really devastating linkages between um, um, mental health and, and suicide rates as well. I, I mean, I, going back to my mind, some um, work that was done particularly around men and sexual abuse, um, looking at care records and then following through their pathways in life and finding of, 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 of uh, particularly this is context as men, I'm sure it's similar to women, was that were 10 times more likely than general population not to just attempt suicide, to actually complete suicide. So I think, you know, the link is between a drug and alcohol, drug and other, uh, sorry, alcohol and other drugs is really profound as a way of coping mechanisms. Uh, a lot of work that I had done also with the pathway into homelessness and all the other attendant sort of social uh, effects that can be really important. Because I think really a lot of it is that indicative stuff around um, what I call that imposter shame, where someone's meant uh, to make feel shame for somebody else's behaviour. And then that whole developing your sense of identity and who you are as a, a young person, how you are as an adult, how you are as a parent, how you are as a mother and a father, with this sort of experience really um, um, shadowing and echoing through your life in very, very different ways as well. But I think the really important message, though, is that even if they have really troubling effects, that, that therapy or counselling or the right sort of information or the right social supports can do a lot to actually minimise um, those effects as well. Um, I've worked with people who are seven. I've worked with people who are in their 70s, you know, so it is really important whatever age and stage to be able to get that help because no one deserves to actually feel responsible for abuse that they had no way of knowing what it was or stopping it. Thank you, David. May, um, Georgia May has asked a question around working with a, a very young client who she's made a report um, about child abuse to, um, but she's wanting to continue to work with that young child to, to create space where, where the child can disclose um, if that's what she wants to do. Can you tell us a little bit about how you work with a child where you've made a report that is being investigated? Oh, thanks. That's a really good question, Dan. And I have to say that actually is quite a um, normal event that I would continue to work with someone who, um, where it's been being investigated because one of the big things about general practice is that we're also seeing them for all sorts of things. So I may not necessarily be seeing them for that particular issue, but I may also be seeing them for other contexts. I guess for those who aren't general practitioners, I think it may be also important to um, think about what role that you're playing in terms of that space. So I think there's one aspect that you don't want to feel that by recognising that's a concern and referring that you are going to stop being involved in their care and in some ways there's a perception of rejection. But by the same token, um, uh, there can be a circumstance which occurs where you have multiple providers with care where sometimes the care can become disjointed and not as cohesive. So it is important in whatever role that you take that it does become part of a team approach. So if you're creating a safe place for that person, which I think is a really valuable thing to have, that safe place is also contextual to the other care that they're actually doing. So by doing that in a team, sometimes what we do is we work out what 
that particular place is going to mean for them and why they're actually engaging and how often that they might actually do that. Um, it doesn't have to be explicit in that every single appointment needs to be, you know, booked in. But I think it's just that it gives them a context about what they're doing. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's actually just a context that, okay, well, maybe you might not have anything particularly that you have to discuss, but those weekly check-its seem to help, so why don't we continue to do so? Um, I find that I often do that for clients where um, they're still emotionally and cognitively making sense of what's actually occurred. And so sometimes um, having some sort of um, unplanned sort of event that they can just be there is actually quite important for them. Great. Thanks, May. Liz, this is a question uh, for you um, from Sonia. Um, what are some of the approaches that you might take uh, when the child is showing some symptoms of more psychiatric distress, maybe such as dissociation or, or even psychosis? Um, this is obviously quite scary for, for the client. Um, how might you approach this? Uh, I'd, I work with, you know, particularly with dissociative clients all the time. Um, and I noticed there was a similar question. Someone asked about what theoretical models I would use. And I mean, the quick answer to that is I use whatever works. But I do particularly like um, the work from the Structural Dissociation Hobbs, so Ono van der Hart and his colleagues. So I, I mean, uh, a dissociating client is um, bread and butter for me. Um, I, uh, it, 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 dissociation is a, at the, you know, it, it's along a continuum of mammalian um, defensive responses and it's really about helping the um, person come back into a sense of reality and help them kind of find a way to make sense of what's happened to them but make sure that it stays in the past. Um, so it's kind of hard to describe quickly in, in this kind of forum but I would point you to um, a book called The Haunted Self. Um, I think uh, it, it, it's quite, it's been, um, quite useful to me to understand those principles and working with people in the room who are dissociating, whether they're children or adults. Yeah, thanks, Liz. David, the next question's for you, and uh, it's from Jamie, who I understand might be a colleague of yours. Um, so Jamie says, we've seen some high prevalence figures for child sexual abuse, and the chances are that kids in therapy may be at even higher risk. What are your views on asking all children in therapy about sexual abuse at some point, or even on entry to therapy, even if it's not their presenting issue? Yeah, I think, you know, as we all look at those prevalence rates, and then if we also say, of those prevalent rates of people who end up in with mental health concerns or uh, children who end up having behavioural issues at schools, the rates are even higher. It really does strike that we do find to have some way of nuancedly checking in and asking uh, children and young people about their experiences. And I think the idea of universal screening has really come, but I think it's important also we are then able to respond effectively to that. So I think asking kids about, uh, or young people, any way are they concerned about their safety is, is really, really important. And then be able to talk to what type of different safety that might be. It might mean that if someone's bullying you at school or if someone's hurting you in any way or, or doing things that making you feel uncomfortable. Um, this also needs to then be tied to a really importantly, you know, the developmental stage and appropriateness of doing that. But as a society... I think we do need to come to terms with, the, unfortunately, um, because of those rates of sexual abuse, we might need to do something a little bit more nuanced. And, you know, if we provide a response that, say, about a child not doing well in classroom and we spend a year doing that and then we find out, like in this scenario, that, um, you know, Gary's abusing Sally, we've sort of missed an opportunity both ethically to do the right thing by Sally but also to provide effective responses because... Or, you know, if we provide response around Sally's schooling and then she's being sexually abused at home and her, her schooling goes down further and further, we can also probably miss the mark as well. So I do think it's worthy of a conversation around uh, this. But I, I think it's also important as practitioners that we become comfortable if the, if the children say yes or, or they don't give us a clear answer, feeling skilled and comfortable enough to actually engage. But with, with the prevalence rates, 
um, I think definitely finding some way to inquire into safety as a minimum is really, really critical. And, and again, about them feeling afraid and fear and about having conversations that sort of scaffold the children to understand why we're asking those questions are really important as well. Mm. Yeah, it's a, a really challenging area, isn't it? Liz, so what's your approach where maybe um, you're working with a, a child um, where child sexual abuse might be um, likely or suspected, um, but the child hasn't yet disclosed? How do you, how do you work with that? Uh, well, it's not something that can be forced out of anyone. Um, so I guess you just hold it in mind and, again, you create a space in which, you know, they they may feel that they are able to tell you in some way. Um, you know, I think, as David was just saying, having sort of some tools in your toolkit about how to kind of, you, you know, um, phrases that you can use to kind of slip into things, you know, to ask about how they're feeling and, you know, that kind of stuff, Um you know, whether someone may have um, hurt them in any way, have they ever felt vulnerable, all of those kind of things is really useful. I think ultimately we know what helps, um, we, you, what is therapeutically um, gold is to be able to develop a, a solid therapeutic relationship. Um, and so, you know, if you can do that, then this is what allows things to emerge in a safe way. You know, if they're not disclosing, if they don't have the language or the feelings are too big, um, and it feels unsafe to express that, then they're not going to tell you. So this is about establishing the space that you're you're working in within with that with that child. Um, so it's not something that you can kind of force out. It might be something that you come at from the side. Hmm. Thanks, Liz. And May, we've had quite a few questions around the common signs of abuse. Um, so what are the common signs of abuse that you observe in the behaviours and moods of children? Yeah, look, it's, it's a good question. You know, I was actually really struck when I read the case that it's probably not the common sort of presentation that you get for someone presenting actually with abuse. Like, um, I certainly have had people who have presented to me as direct parental concerns about child behaviours, including sexualised behaviours, genital irritation or urinary tract infections. Um, but it's actually uncommon. Um, so if we think about abuse in general, it can actually present really like anything. Um, it can present just like someone coming in more often. So actually that whole revolving door of people coming in, but you're never quite sure what they're coming in for, or, or actually they may be coming in for very valid things, but they're just coming in more often than what you might see. Other um, equivalent um, developmentally um, aged children um, to come in for, um, or they might um, be presenting more with symptoms of distress, acting out or being more withdrawn or a combination of any of those. Um, children often present with more somatic symptoms um, such as abdominal pain, um, uh, constipation or disorders of eating. Um, and they can present with school refusals or difficulties, which is what Liz was talking to and what David was talking to, that um, that can often be an early warning symptom. So older children might present with any of these, um, but they might also present with more risk-taking behaviours um, or a concern about vulnerability um, in relationships. I often consider it when story and presenting issues don't really fit together. Like there's something that I'm missing about what's going on and that's when I might start to ask about what could be some common sort of gaps and abuse is one of those things which might be part of the gap in the story. Mm. Thanks, May. Uh, um, can David, I just make... yeah, oh, I'm just going to make one other um, point when we talk about common signs of abuse, though. I think sometimes when we're asking about abuse, um, we sometimes want to get all the details about what's happened with abuse. And yeah. just a reminder that we don't have to, we just need to be listening out for it, kind of what Liz, what Liz was talking about, because it's not the actual... Um, almost precarious uh, insight into what happened, which is important. It's more just the fact that it's, it's a need for help and where to direct them. Thank you, May. Um, and a question for David. Thank you to the um, people in the, the uh, chat room. These questions are really fantastic um, and interesting. So thank you to all of you who are posting questions. We'll try to get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes. 
Question for you, David, from America. What can be done or should be considered when the parent is disbelieving of the child's experience or maybe not fully engaged in providing support for their child? Yeah. I think it's really important, actually. I'll, I'll go back to a statement Liz made, which I really love, Liz, actually, about the best buffer against this type of trauma is that children are held in the mind of their caregiver. Um, and that really importance of actually supporting caregivers or um, um, parents in this context as well. And, and what might be the barriers that they are experiencing, what, what restraining factors that they may be experiencing that um, doesn't allow them to sort of um, hold that child in their mind as, as much as they, they, their intentions are, but their, their actions sometimes, particularly because the power differences between adults and children, we need to be able to support them and hold them also to be able to do that. So if, if, it, if it might be simply just simply overwhelmed, and we, 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 again, in this whole scenario we're looking at, we don't know the context before, like Sally was separated, what else has gone on in their lives, what these own experiences around not being believed about experiences of abuse. And some of these can be very overwhelming when a child is abused and a sense of failure as a parent can be an incredibly overwhelming sort of experience. So first of all, just to be able to provide the capacity to respond by providing enough support to the parent as well. Or she may be in a situation where, um, you know, um, a lot of the families that we work with, it's not just the children are being abused, there may also be abuse and violence occurring towards the parents as well. We know through our screening we do here at Relation Australia that, you know, feelings of safety in relationships, you know, 50 to 60 of our clients have a significant issue around feeling safe as well. What are the power dynamics in that relationship? And it may make it really tricky when um, Janet's not in a place to believe or support. And I think it's really important that we um, engage Janet in those conversations to really understand what's going on for her. What are the barriers to support that child as well? Because it can be uh, incredibly traumatic to go from one one position where this person's your partner to suddenly this person is someone who's you know sexually abusing your child it can be a very traumatic sort of experience and the whole range of grief and loss and some of that can have them acting in ways where you know they're not being the parents they need to be for their own kids as well but how do we do that in a way that sort of guides them into a, a conversation that holds their dignity both as a parent as an individual but also can you know provide you know high support and also high challenge when need to around what impact does those sort of comments have on your daughter? Is that what you're hoping to affect you're going to have on your daughter if she, you know, believes somehow this is her fault as well? Because it can be really critical to engage parents, I think. Thanks, David. And we might just stick with you if that's okay, um, because Anna's asked, how might you work with young people or children, for that matter, to uh, describe um, strong feelings, strong positive feelings towards um, the person that sexually abused them or may even think that um, part of what they did was demonstrating love. Yeah, and I think that's why it's important we understand the co social context. And as I said, violence is something that occurs in a social context. It involves two people. It also involves the way that that social system makes sense and meaning of those sort of behaviours as well. And I, you know, a lot of my background working with young people who have been cut off from family and become homeless or in care backgrounds as well, and are sort of needing that sense from attachment to have a, a sort of a parental-like figure as well. And the tactics of abusers take that into mind and 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 use trickery and manipulation as well, and may have a, you know, it's a complicated sort of relationship where they, there is some positive feelings from the abuser, but generally it's not the abuse that they wanted. So it is asking the young, what were they looking in that relationship? And going back to that responsible adult sort of exercise, they're wanting an adult who could look after them, could take care of them, that was on their side, you know, a sense of, you know, almost someone else is on my team, somebody else to use Liz's for keeping them in mind. But it wasn't the abuse that they wanted as well. And often that's what the young person may want to defend, to hold it, yes, but that's the only person on my side and my team. And to be able to acknowledge that those needs are real and meaningful but it doesn't mean the abuse was right and never can be right. But it can be a very complicated untangling process. And that's one of the phrases I always use. It's sort of like sometimes for a lot of young people who have been developmentally challenged, both in terms of other experiences, abuse, care, background, homelessness, um, untangling, it's sometimes like untangling fishing wire until you sort of push against it. You don't sort of realise how you're tangled. But that's being really clear in that, you know, abuse is never okay. And what they were looking for was care, love, attention, just like any young person or child would want, but they weren't wanting abuse.
Thank you, David. Liz, we've had quite a few questions um, from the chat room about how you might work with children and families where the perpetrator is still in the family um, and often still having contact with the family members. Um, again, tricky. Um, if, I mean, I think you first have to go to your mandatory obligations around making sure that their um, appropriate reports have been made um, and that there's an appropriate safety net around this child to protect them from further abuse. Um, in terms of, it depends partly on the context in which that continued contact is going on. Um, you know, are, is, it, is this a caregiver for the child? Is this uh, an acquaintance? Is this someone coming into the home? Um, but I think it is, uh, you know, assuming that it's not a, hopefully a primary caregiver, then you would be working with the parent to establish some very clear boundaries around what is okay and not okay for that child. Uh, that's not, and, and making it very clear that it's not the child's responsibility to manage that boundary, that someone else has to do that for them. Um, so, it, it, you know, I think stick to your mandatory obligations, um, make sure that they're, you know, uh, and, and keep, keep yelling if you need to and making reports if they're not being heard. Um, and, um, you know, really exploring why that person is still in contact with the child, really, I think is important to understand that as well in terms of managing that, that particular issue. Thanks, Liz. May, a question for you uh, from Rashmi, who's asked, can sexual abuse uh, be emotional or psychological towards children, or does it always have to be, uh, or does it always have to include physical abuse? Sorry, is this about sexual abuse um, yes. occurring in yes. other ways as well? Yes, yes. I, I mean, I would, I would consider that um, it can occur in a multitude of ways. And if we consider abuse, sexual abuse is one of those, but then we can also consider that emotional and psychological abuse is probably actually the most common abuse that we actually see. And given that often the sexual abuse often occurs to a person who's known to the child, it's often associated with physical and emotional abuse as well, because particularly in child sexual abuse, there's often some period before that occurs where the child's often groomed or psychologically primed um, to accept um, that, that, that interaction, um, which I would, I would think would be, um, which would also, which is, is often just if not more damaging, I think, than the physical intimacy. If you look at some of the statistics in terms of what seems to make an impact in terms of child sexual abuse. Um, yes, the more horrific the event does have an impact, but it's also the length of time that it's been occurring, the, the age of the child when it occurred at, and also if there's a feeling of helplessness or a feeling that they can't get out of the situation. So if the, ch the child feels like they're, or they're able to actually get out of the situation or take action about it, that can be in some ways protective for them. Um, so I'd consider that psychological and emotional comes part and parcel of it. It's kind of what David was talking about, about the power imbalances. Mm, thanks, May. David, a question for you, um, a question from Kerry, talking about how do we prepare children um, and a supportive caregiver uh, for upcoming uh, court processes that they may be going through? Yeah, I think the whole criminal justice system is another sort of step and process which um, is really, you know, wraps around the whole recovery sort of process, which is really important. I think the most important thing, you know, and again, um, something we need to keep yelling, <laughs> to go back to what Liz was saying before, about is unfortunately we have a criminal justice system that still produces really quite poor outcomes in terms of overall conviction rates. So I, I haven't kept up to date with the child sexual assault sort of field, but I know through adult sexual assault, it's only about 1% of all sexual assaults end up in a, a conviction as well. But that being said, the criminal justice process can be really vital and, and you know, find a pace of recovery and, um, you know, honouring if done well. So I think the really important thing is, you know, and this is one of my... Uh, great bugbears as well, I have to say, is often we, because of the criminal justice process, we sort of limit the amount of support children and young people get in the fear that we'll somehow contaminate evidence. 
but then when they're willing then to put them through a process where they'll be cross-examined, asked questions in different ways to try to trick them up and was it a Tuesday this occurred? Oh, in your statement you said it was a Monday. You know, all that sort of quite horrendous process, which I think developmentally is just really unfair and we shouldn't allow it to occur, but that's the process we have at the moment. So really to be able to get a child really clear that regardless of whatever the outcome of the criminal justice system is, the truth is the truth. What this person did to you was okay and, and it was wrong. Rather, if they get a guilty or they get a not guilty or, or just the case collapses and never goes ahead, that regardless that, you know, the truth is the truth and what this person did was wrong, it was never okay, is, is the one message I keep on supporting parents and, and young people and children who go through this process as well. Because the other thing which most people don't realise, they assume a court case just happens in a month. You know, like you talk to the police and the person's arrested and a month later it all happens. How long this process can go on for? I've worked with children. I mean, it's been a year or two years or three years this can occur in as well. And often that can be just really daunting if you're not aware of that stuff. So more information you can have about the way criminal justice systems post at work. I'm really a big one for, you know, desensitising children, like taking them into court, showing them what happens, talking about that process as much as possible but I do get worried when we say, let's stop therapy because of this criminal justice process, because um, a child's making meaning and sense of that in a really critical stage. If a child's eight, and they're going to be 10 or 11 before that's finished, we've really missed the really vital age to provide some good information and support as well. I hope I haven't been very um, down on the criminal justice process, but I, you know, I believe it's an important stage and process. But equally, the, the mental health outcomes of the child should be, or the young person should be quite central as well. Yeah, thanks, David. And thank you to uh, our panellists. I'm sure you'll agree that have been uh, really great presentations and really thoughtful and considerate answers to the fantastic questions we got from the 1,535 of you who are, who are tuned in at the moment. So what I'm going to ask now for our three, pa uh, three panellists, we're just going to give them a final uh, thought or observation to reflect or sum up with. Uh, May, we might start with you, if that's OK. Um, thank you. Look, um, I, I thought I'd probably just sum up and think about um, the fact that um, one, that it's actually more common than what we might be thinking. So to be looking out for it, even if it's not explicitly stated, that's what the presenting thing is. Um, and that um, working within a team and looking at the structural support around is going to be really important. Um, and that we need to be mindful that this is all pretty horrific and traumatising and awful for the family and the parents, but also for ourselves. So we need to make sure that we're also looking after ourselves as well. Um, and there's lots of ways that we can look into doing that. Thank you, mate, and thank you for tonight. David? Yeah, I think the really critical thing is, I mean this conversation is brought to mind that it's really important that we not only think about the individual ways we provide therapies and social response, but also what social changes we need as a community as well to keep children and young people safe. And I think that, that those, those belief systems that are still out there and functioning um, are very easily um, taken in by perpetrators and, and then internalised by children and young people who experience abuse. So we really need to be keep yelling, I quite like that phrase, that... Um, this shouldn't be going on in, in 2020 in Australia. And the really critical thing we can also do, um, to go back to the wellbeing sort of question is, you know, that we can provide effective responses to children and young people. Is possible change is possible? And that can be also important for us to reflect as workers, that we're not just in this really hard, difficult work, but also we can be involved in an amazing process of people um, resisting and responding to the effects of abuse. And, you know, there's some amazing people I've come into contact through during my work that... I still hold on to those children and young people I spoke to many, many years ago, and they are still in the room with me now when I speak to children and young people, even when I try, had a conversation today with a, a, a young person. Thank you, David, and, and for your comments and uh, views tonight. Liz. Mm. Just sitting here listening to all of this and seeing some of the questions that have come across, like it just reinforces how complex issue is at many, many levels. And I guess the thing that really popped into my mind when I was thinking about this is that we have to remember that children exist within a systemic context and the most important system for, for children 
most of the time is their family. And so we have to be working within that context. It's never a child, you know, as an individual. And so I guess I would be stressing that this can, this has to, um, you know, that often, you know, you may not, it, particularly if the child is young, you may not actually be working directly with the child, but you need to have skills to work with a family and all of the complex and nuanced kind of layers of meaning and blame and shame that they bring to um, into your room. And uh, that is really, you know, it can be really tricky. And so you have to be patient. It's not a, a quick process at all. Um, and I would just echo again what, May was saying that you need a way to kind of manage this, uh, you know, with all of the all of the uh, tragedy that you see in working in this space that is healthy um, and allows you to keep kind of uh, doing this important work. Thank you, Liz, and thank you to all our three panelists. Um, really uh, thoughtful um, observations tonight and great um, practical strategies to, to working with children and their families. So thank you to May, David and Liz. Okay, so um, if you've uh, enjoyed tonight's webinar and would like to keep on reading, please um, use the blue icon um, uh, to have a look at our further resources. May, I know, had uh, talked a little bit about those in her um, presentation and we've also got a couple of um, resources from Emerging Minds including a new practice paper from uh, Dr Sophie Guy which um, I think uh, will be really helpful for you all. So for all, more information on this uh, please visit Emerging Minds website on www.emergingminds.com.au so please ensure that you complete the feedback survey before you log out. These um, feedback surveys are really important for us to, to be able to get better at, the, at what we are able to produce um, and have been very helpful in the past. So please do that before you leave. Um, you'll, you'll receive a statement of attendance for this webinar within the next four to six weeks. And each participant will be sent a link to the recording of this webinar and associated online resources within four to six weeks. Um, so that's the last of, our, uh, of the webinars in our second series. Um, really personally uh, enjoyed all uh, of the topics that we've been able to traverse this, uh, this financial year and all the fantastic guests that we've been able to invite on. We'll be launching a third series of webinars in September and this will be introducing uh, child and family practice to parents. Uh, that'll be facilitated by Jackie Lee from Emerging Minds. The following webinar will be facilitated by Ben Rogers and will be describing the skills of trauma-informed practice. That will be in October of this year. I'll be back with you for the remainder of the third series in November when we'll present a webinar on engaging fathers and their children. The other webinars in the third series will also touch on engaging children with complex communication needs, working with parents who have their children removed, and working uh, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children and communities. So this webinar was co-produced by MHPN and Emerging Minds for the Emerging Minds National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health Project. The National Workforce Centre for Child Mental Health is led by Emerging Minds and is delivered in partnership through the Australian Institute of Family Studies, the Australian National University, the Parenting Research Centre, in the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners. The NWCCMH is funded by the Australian Government Department of Health under the National Support for Child and Young Youth Mental Health Programs. MHN supports the engagement and ongoing maintenance of practitioner networks where clinicians from distant disciplines meet regularly with other mental health practitioners, share tips and resources, build local referral pathways and engage in CPT activities. Due to the current environment, most MHPN webinars and networks have been postponed. However, some are organising Zoom meetings. Contact your local coordinator if you'd like more information. So before I close, I'd just like to acknowledge the consumers and carers who've lived with mental health in the past and those who continue to live with mental illness in the present. Thank you so much to everyone for participating this evening. Good night.